Good morning, everyone, and welcome to On the Wrong Lead presents Saratoga Daily. I am Mark, and uh, today is August 29th. Uh, it is a big day at Saratoga. A bunch of graded stakes going on today. Really solid card, and uh, we we had a bit of a monkey wrench thrown in here. I'll, I'll look out. I don't know if you can see it. I can't see out my window that well. Uh, it is gray. It is overcast. It's in the mid 60s, and it is raining. Uh, so this has really thrown a monkey wrench into a lot of people's handicapping, and I had some. Somebody asked if I could talk about Tomlinson figures and talk about wet handicapping specifically. So I'm going to change it up here and uh, we're going to walk through a couple of races that I think massively change given the off going today. Uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, about what happened yesterday at Saratoga. So um, yeah, I uh, we I gave out a pick three. First leg of the pick three, I caught one of my C's, and I said, oh, "Okay, cool, that's fine." Um, you know, I uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. I caught my price. Hopefully, the rest of this chalks out a bit. Uh, and then in the second leg, apparently David. Cohen can ride a turf race if it's on a Chad Brown horse, um, you know. So uh, got blown up in the second leg to a, to a bit of a price, and uh, then I thought a what I thought was a turf horse turned out the turf the horse could also run on dirt. So uh, needless to say, I was good in the first leg, and my last two legs of the uh, of the pick three did not. We're not fruitful, let's put it that way. I had a pretty rough day. I uh, don't think I cashed a winning ticket. And um, yeah, then went to Charlestown and almost hit the trifecta in the classics. So um, yeah, uh, it was it was a rough day overall. Um, but let's talk about a couple of things uh, at Saratoga, what tends to happen on these wet off days. Uh, first thing, you want to be forwardly placed. A lot of kickback. Um, and we've seen, we caught probably maybe three tenths, four tenths of an inch of rain overnight. Looks like it's going to sort of stop raining here between sort of nine and noon. And then it looks like there's going to be more thunderstorms late. Uh, so, you know, the track caught enough water that they put a float on, which means they're trying to keep the water from penetrating in. But, uh, you still are going to have a very wet, very sloppy track, and everything is off the turf with the exception of the two stakes races, so you're not going to really get a good turf preview until you're right in a stakes race. Um, but things that normally happen at Saratoga uh, on these days, um, inside versus outside bias, I would just watch the track and see. We saw a pronounced inside bias. The rail was very good yesterday all day. Uh, I don't know if that'll be the same today, it's a different day. They've worked the surface again. That water's had a chance to penetrate. Let's see. I, I would play that one by ear. But I would say you do want to be forwardly placed. You On wet days, kickback is brutal. Horses don't like to come rolling through kickback, especially cheaper horses. In a stakes race, I'm less, less concerned about a closer that's shown the ability to run on a wet track. Um, but in cheaper horses, I, I definitely want a horse that's forwardly placed. It's not eating all that kickback. Um, also, historically, and, and I hate saying this because they're going to probably prove me wrong, there are a couple of jockeys that are not very good at reading a bias, and those jockeys are both the Ortizes, uh, Arad and Jose, Javier Castellano, and Joel Rosario, sort of the big four at Saratoga. None of those guys are great at reading a bias, and on off days, you see a lot of little jocks, you know, smaller time jocks. Eric Cancel, Manny Franco, Kendrick's great at a bias. Dylan Davis is great at reading a bias. Um, you'll also, see, you know, and also I think Cohen also makes a lot of sense. Uh, and also Santana. Santana can, is, can be very good at reading a bias. So jocks that are not as uh, as known Saratoga jocks oftentimes will have really good days, and you'll see some really good reads off those jocks. Uh, I think it's from the fact that they play a lot of those guys run aqueduct during the winter where it's an absolute mess and it's wet every day and they just get good at reading biases so let's start in this second race this race has been taken off from the turf uh you know i think a lot of money is going to flow so the interesting thing about these off the turf races is that uh you know the morning line f is that a lot of horses that uh you know, people will handicap these the night before they'll get into the race the day of and they sort of don't like to throw away their handicapping. They don't like to, oh, I did all this work. I, I don't want to toss it. In this race, to me, uh, the nine, um, you know, Empty Tomb is just a massive standout in here. Empty Tomb's an MTO. Uh, if you look at this race in the slop, two back, ran an 80 buyer speed fake. I realized the horse didn't win, and the horse doesn't have a win on a sloppy surface. 
I think this field came up easier than that. And of the of the dirt horses in here, of the horses that are um, you know MTOs in here, this is the only MTO that's going to be a forwardly placed MTO. You got Jose Ortiz up. I realize I said he's not the best at reading a bias, but he's going to have this horse very forwardly placed. I think this horse is just super logical at 10 to 1. Um, you know, I think uh, NYC is going to take a ton of money. I don't think the horse, I'm a big Wet Thomason's person. If you don't know what that is, it's a pedigree analysis that looks at a horse's propensity to run on an off track. It's this number in brackets here, right next to where it says wet. A horse is not, I, anything over 400 is considered very good. 327 is not that good. I don't know if this horse really handles. Um, you know, really handles the off going. And I also think that this horse very well may be scratched. You're going to see a situation here. I'm doing this pre-scratch because on wet days, oftentimes scratches come up very late. I didn't want to wait until 11 in the morning to put this out. Uh, so I think NYC very well may be scratched because he definitely stepped it up in the last time out on the turf. And I think that, you know, Pletcher's figured out he has a turf horse here. I think this horse scratches, Jose Ortiz ends up on the nine. I think the nine is just super, super logical in here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you know, someone like the 11 Dynamax Prime, if you look at the sloppy figs, did run an 80, you know, ran this very nice 85, but this horse is more outwardly drawn in this race and is a closer. If you look at these you know, these figures, I don't know if this one can stay as close. Uh, it may be out the back early. Um, other horses, obviously, Isle of Jackson is super logical and is a horse you have to include. Uh, horse is only one for three on and off track, uh, but is a horse that does sort of fit. This 88 in the slop makes a lot of sense, and the horse does have a win over the slop. My my concern with that with Isle of Jackson is his form is sort of been tailing off uh, when he's been catching. You know, he, that's a that was a nice race, but it doesn't seem like he's been uh, quite as good as of his last two starts. Um, We'll see if Linda can uh, can move that one back forward. And I think Expert is also another horse that makes some sense, has some wins on an off going as well. Um, the other horse that's sort of the wild card in here is Dream Friend has over a 400 buyer. That would make you think that Dream Friend can handle an off going track. My concern is the second race out uh, d did not. Now, the thing is, Maiden, Maiden Breaker first out runs back in an off track. You've taken a horse that, uh, you know, Maiden Breaker's f last out first time versus winners is not a good win angle to begin with. And then you add the extra layer of it being an off track. I would be willing to give Dream Friend a second chance to prove that he can handle the off going. Um, I, don't, I don't see a reason why he couldn't. So let's hop into the third race here. Uh, you know, I talked very much about liking Vanzi in here, and I still do really like Vanzi, but all of a sudden a couple of prices make a lot more sense in here for me. Uh, this is the Saranac, by the way, at a mile. Uh, this has been moved to the Melon, if I remember correctly, uh, because uh, the Melon is the outer of the two turf courses, and the Melon has actually banked, so it has better, uh, better drainage. And so, yeah, they, they've moved this one to the melon, apparently. I don't think that changes the pace setup a ton in here. Um, I still think Vanzi makes a lot of sense, and Vanzi is probably my, my top pick. But the other sort of horses that all of a sudden I think you have to use uh, would be the seven, Iris Mias. Um, if you look at this horse, the form doesn't really fit for this race. But if you notice this, good turf ran an 83 that Transylvania could be one of the better horses or better races this horse has ever run and also back here in the award uh, threw up a good figure on a uh, on a good track the other thing that I liked about this horse is I've been using a lot of uh, a lot of time form uh, US pace figures in here if you or sorry uh, speed figures in here if you go back and you look at that Transylvania ran a 110 that's the highest um, the highest figure of any horse on a track or on a turf course that was not firm. So I think Irish Mias moves up a ton here and you're getting 12 to one. So you're sort of getting paid to play. I'm willing to take a shot that that horse maybe likes a little bit of a softer going. The other horse in here that I thought became really interesting is a, is a horse Josh had talked about, about Bodie Cream, who was this private purchase for, uh, you know, it moved over into the Maker Barn. Uh, 
this horse also has shown, um, you know, has a win over a good turf and ran really well in this optional 50 off a yielding turf course. This one has shown the ability or, or a bit of a propensity, likes this distance, and also seems to like a little bit of a softer going. So I think it moves Bodhi Cream up a lot. So where, where when I first had capped this, I thought this was... I was going to be single A'd here. All of a sudden, I now have three A's, um, and those would be my, my three A's that I've listed here. Um, let me see what other races were interesting. I thought that, uh, let's go down here to some of the more feature races. Let's hop into the Amsterdam. Uh, you know, in, in, in the Amsterdam, uh, Yopan, the, the two, still is my top choice. Uh, if we look at these big Tomlinson figures, horses never run on uh, you know, on off going, but this horse will be forwardly placed. Uh, Rosario will have a lot of positional choice. Should be able to get get sort of clear. And if you know if the rail is good, he should he you know he's going to own the rail. Basin doesn't isn't doesn't normally break that fast. Uh, so if he, if the rail's real good, Yopan's going to get the rail, and it gives Rosario a ton of choices. So I think that it, he actually moves up Yopan in here uh, for me. Um, once and then let's and and I wouldn't change anything else. I'd said I like Basin as a C. I still like Basin as a C. I don't and I would say let's actually flip flipping back to this race for a second more. We had talked a lot on our live stream about the three Liam's Pride, um, Wonder where Craig is and uh, and Long Weekend, who all came out of that sloppy Gold Fever at Belmont. I'd mentioned I didn't like the race. I thought it looked terrible when you watched it live. I think with this track coming up sloppy, you can 100% toss all three of those horses. Uh, they were pretty hard fades for me, and they've, they've just been horses I'm just not going to use now. None of them really showed a propensity to run on an off going, even though they all sort of should have. No, Nobody had really bad Tomlinson's in there. So it makes me move those three down even more. Let's hop into the uh into the you know i think the forego for me stays pretty much the same one thing i would say depending on how you're structuring tickets i still love whatmore he's got wins on an off going and you know I, th I think this you know he's run some huge figures uh his count fleet which is one of his better races ever was on and off track so i think whitmore makes a ton of sense one horse though that I had said I had liked, and I move up even more in the off going is Lex Antonian. Uh, he's never caught an off track, which is, you know, always first time you do anything with a horse, it's always a little scary. But this 466 Wet Tomlinson's makes me think that this one should just love the off going. And he's also a speedy type, he's going to be forwardly placed. I think if, you know, if there's ever a chance of him uh, getting to the front and, you know, in pulling one of these off, I think this is it. And I, I move him up quite a bit in here. Another horse is, I obviously talked about the homebred, funny guy. Um, funny guy's two for two on an off track. And although the Tomlinson's aren't huge, uh, he's shown propensity to really like it, albeit those were unrestricted or state bred races. So not as good a company as we're facing today, you know, but when I look at a horse and I see this 87 buyer speed fig and I see lower on either side, it makes me think, geez, actually the softer going, uh, you know, the sloppy going moved him up a little bit. So if we're talking, he's obviously turned a corner and he's running better this year than he did last year. If he's running, you know, 98 and 101 and he can move a couple of points forward, all of a sudden he's a massive player in this race. Does have to come, needs a little bit of pace setup, has to come from off it. And I'll, I've said that Rosario I always find is a little suspect on the off going, but I think it probably moves funny guy forward as well. Uh, the other horse that I did not like before, and all of a sudden I think you have to kind of put him back in the consideration, is complexity. Um, you know, has the Tomlinsons that make him a player in here with these, uh, you know, these 420s. And again, a forwardly placed horse that can probably set a nice trip. I don't love it, but uh, you know, I definitely don't love him. I think he's going to be over bet. He's probably a fade on value alone, but all of a sudden he makes some more sense in here. Uh, let me see what else we had in here. Uh, I think the Sword Dancer stays much the same. And I think the Maiden race after was the one I was sort of interested in. Yeah. So this tenth race is a six furlong Maiden race that all of a sudden becomes extremely, extremely interesting. So there's there's only one works horse, and this is always Karina's, and I think always Karina has to be an A. 380, uh, you know, wet Tommies are not terrible. So this is one that makes a ton of sense. There are a couple other horses that I thought 
that now you might get some price on, which I think makes sense in the, on the off going. I had mentioned both Spundeta the eight and Rookery the nine uh, when we had done our live stream. I had liked them before, so that's a good thing. I also, if you find a, a horse with experience with a race, first thing when they run into a sloppy condition, they might not have never tra- they may have never trained in it. It's a it's even more unnerving than it would be. There's a lot of other new noises, those types of things. So I like a horse with experience, and also. You know, I know some of Maggie would say a horse like this would be a little more tucked up. They're going to have a little bit more form. They're going to be in a little better conditioning. You want a horse with conditioning because going across a sloppy surface is more tiring. I like horses that have a start over a horse that does not have a start. So big Tomlinson's horses with starts um, and a hor- and you know at least with Spandetta a horse with some speed. I think that moves the eight and the nine up for me. They were A's before, and now they're A's that I may try to build tickets around. I may try to try to target this late sequence for something like a pick three, um, or even a pick five through the late, because uh, I think I can I think I can sort of buy that seventh leg. All of a sudden, this late structure becomes very interesting when I'm seeing prices that make a lot of sense and have some things that I sort of target, especially when there's. If you look at the middle part of the middle part of this race, is you have a million dollar horse, you have these big money purchases with sexy pedigrees, uh, you know, three hundred sixty thousand dollar horse. You have always Karina the Works horse. Those horses are going to draw a lot of money, and I don't think on pedigree they make a ton of sense in the off going. So I think some of the prices get moved up, and I think some of these sort of sexy pedigree big purchase horses get moved down. Um, so, yeah. Uh, you know that's kind of what I wanted to cover. Uh, I don't have a pick three at the moment. I'll wait for scratches and hop on Discord. There'll be a link to Discord in the description, and I can give you some some plays, some structures that I like. Uh, you know, uh, it was a bad day yesterday. Hopefully, we can have a little better one today. Uh, if you like this content, please like and subscribe to it. it means a lot to us. It gets us a little more visibility. And until uh, till next time, good luck at the races.